Welcome back to SFF 180 Retro, the series where I discuss older SFF novels, not necessarily classics, but still ones that are worthy of your rediscovery. In this episode, in the year 2018, a privately funded manned mission to Mars may have discovered evidence of life in underground caves in Gregory Benford's The Martian Race. Hello everybody, Thomas here. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. Mars has been very much in people's minds lately. No wonder, after all, there is a, uh, a bit of a best-selling novel out there and a hit movie adaptation that's making the rounds. Mars has naturally been capturing people's imaginations. Ever since Percival Lowell peered through his telescope and thought he saw a bunch of happy Martians cruising along a vast network of canals on their steampunk sea -dews. In addition to being the setting for the genre's most timeless classics of both the alien invasion story and planetary romance, Mars has been the choice destination for many acclaimed and award-winning hard science fiction novels as well. Hell, Andy Weir wasn't even the first guy to strand an astronaut there. Here's a book from 15 years ago written by an actual NASA scientist who worked on the Spirit and Opportunity missions. But one of my favorite underappreciated hard SF Martian sagas is the 1999 Gregory Benford novel The Martian Race. Benford was, of course, a Nebula winner for his 1980 novel Timescape and is also a physicist. In this book, it's 2018, the state of America's space program could be best described as total disarray, and NASA's attempt at a manned Mars expedition has resulted in a disastrous launching pad explosion. Therefore, it is up to private enterprise to get us into space. Into the ring jumps a charismatic and flamboyant billionaire, John Axelrod, who announces his plans to be the first to get a team of astronauts up to Mars and bring back some real science. But his motives aren't exactly altruistic, right? He not only intends to bag a $30 billion prize, but he hopes to reap millions, if not billions more, in licensing, merchandising, endorsement deals, what have you. The team has four members, biologist Julia Barth and her pilot-slash-engineer boyfriend Victor, who is Russian and who speaks in that kind of pronoun-omitting Middle European accent that is so cheesy every time you hear it in movies, but it's not so intrusive here that it is really bothersome all that much. Now, their marriage is actually encouraged by Axelrod. He turns it into a major media event, giving Benford the opportunity to have a lot of fun, casting a critical and even satirical eye at the way in which a crass commercialism in a consumerist society is the sort of thing that science has to depend on. So his astronauts do, you know, endorsements for a special version of the Mars bar, and they do skits on Saturday Night Live. And so instant celebrity descends upon the mission and its fairly bewildered crew. But it doesn't take long before Julia and Victor and their fellow team members begin to enjoy the newfound fame and wealth. Why wouldn't they? But looming behind all of the spotlights and all the attention is the threat of a competing mission from the Chinese. Now, under the moniker of the Consortium, Axelrod's team does get to the Red Planet first. Explorations go smoothly. Then, while exploring some crevices that appear to be vents leading to vast underground cave networks, Julie discovers what can only be life in its most primordial form, a kind of deep-dwelling biomass. But how extensive is it? How advanced is it as a life form? Julia wrestles with whether or not she should go ahead and make the announcement to a, a news-hungry world while the Chinese are still en route. Is it possible that her discovery uh, could get overtaken? Other problems emerge. The Earth return vehicle meant for the consortium team, which was originally launched by NASA to serve that mission that blew up, has been damaged. And a backup return vehicle was one of those little corners that Axelrod cut in order to get his mission up and out to Mars before the Chinese. And so will their team make it home, or will they have to Hitch a ride with the competition. The story is impressively lacking in fat. It's very swiftly paced. Simmering tensions between the crew members are dramatized convincingly without resorting to over-the-top melodrama. And like any good hard SF exploration story, there is a thick tension in the very best moments where the ever-present fear that even one little misstep could lead to complete tragedy. And through all of it, Benford anchors his story in two extremely likable protagonists. I really, really liked Julie and Victor. They're terrific together. I even kind of liked the way that Benford resisted making Axelrod this one-dimensional, stereotypical, wealthy slime ball, right? I mean, the, the guy's not exactly Donald Trump. He's a little closer to Elon Musk, right? I mean, yes, he is a ruthless businessman, 
but in his own sort of bottom line focused way, he does care. And he manages to, to be pretty cool as a character, despite, you know, his natural tendency to look at absolutely everything he sees as a kind of exploitable resource. The book ends satisfyingly on all counts, as the stage appears set for a new chapter in the course of humanity, although more of a Martian chapter than an Earthbound chapter for humanity. And so while it probably lacks the effortless universal appeal of Andy Weir's The Martian, The Martian Race is still a hard SF tale that anybody outside of, you know, the nuts and bolts geek crowd can find accessible and highly enjoyable. This really is what real sense of wonder, spirit of adventure science fiction ought to be. And that is all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180 Retro. I want to thank all of you for joining me. Remember the single most important thing. These are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please leave a like. Check the description below for all of the relevant links. Share this video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends. And above all, please sub. That is how SFF 180 grows as a channel. And until I see all you guys next time, happy reading.